So yes, so my name is Julian Thomas, and uh, today I will present a subject called uh, Limitations of Android Permission System, Packages, Processes, and uh, User Privacy. So I think, just a precision, uh, by limitation, I didn't want to say vulnerability or whatever. Uh, I will let you judge, is it a vulnerability or not? So that's why we use limitations, so to let kind of uh, your, you, you get your own vision of that. So uh, this work is mainly does the uh, project, project that we started in the company near, now, nearly two years ago. And if you're more interested about the project protected, I'm very happy to talk about that one too. So the presentation will be quite structured in six parts, so a quick introduction to remind very briefly what's permission, how it works, and we'll hand that with um, a demo if everything is okay. And then I will go more into details about three subjects, which is her vision of how permission can be modeled, and then what can we deduce from that in terms of the limitation of the algorithm that implement this model, and in more general way, what's the limitation of this UID-based security that is implemented in Android um, for user privacy mainly. In the fifth step, I will present an analysis so the feedback we got from Google, the feedback from the market, and other software that exist, and I will finish with a conclusion. So first of all, the objective of this talk, uh, because I think it's always very important to explain why do we talk. So the objective is to explain, obviously, how permission works and are implemented on Android, because I think it's a very interesting subject. It's also to explain where vulnerability was found, so what kind of vulnerability and where was it found. Because when we explain that, well, it also leaves the audience with something after the talk, which is what can they do to extend the presented subject. Um, so we'll obviously also um, illustrate the limitation of the UID-based security model in Android. One note very important is that we stick in the presentation to what was flagged by Google as overdue or working as intended or fixed. All the others that are still pending, we will not get into details for quite obvious reasons. Um, another note, so as I said, it was on the Protect Aid project that we made this um, study. And um, just like to explain where the, all that study come from, well, it was just like not security at all problem. It was like we wanted to provide a VPN at the software level of the uh, project. And we get a very big problem, which was the indisability un to say which application wants to connect to internet when one knows that an, a UID wants to connect to internet. So based on this indisability, uh, we decided it would be good to understand why we cannot say which application, and then we deduce from the UID and all the security limitation of the algorithm on Android. So that was for the objective. So a very brief introduction about permission on Android. So a very important thing is what you had before and after Marshmallow, because in Marshmallow, we start to have what we call the dangerous permission, which are now um, requested to the user. So you, the user have to approve for an application, for example, to access your contact, to access your calendar before it was done at install. So you had the paradigm before, which was when installing the app, the app has all the permission it requested. And now, well, that's not the case anymore. So you have, let's say, three or four level of permissions. You have the normal, normal permissions, which are granted on install, so that still remain. Then you have dangerous permissions, which are granted on user request only. So normally it's impossible to get a dangerous permission, such as contact, without the user consent. Well, we'll see that. And then you have signature permissions that are granted on a very specific condition that the signature match. So it's kind of a normal permission because it's granted on install, but on the condition that the signature of the application will request the permission is the same as the one who defined it. So it's, for example, used on, um, on system level. For people who already know uh, Android model and the security, so this talk will involve the concept of shared user ID. Um, so it's already known, I mean, like it's not new. Um, so the concept is just to say that if I put here, yeah, you have this shared user ID, which says that, okay, so this application, we share the ID with other applications that define the same user ID. So it's a very well-known issue that sometimes the, for the system, you could do the same. So we'll not talk about this well-known issue, but we'll talk how we can use the shared user ID to make new um, attack or exploit new limitations. We will not talk neither about the concept of first one in wins, meaning that before Marshmallow, and that's why we'll also stick to, to Marshmallow, is that before Marshmallow, well, you could say that if you define the permission first, you own it. If another application try to define it, 
well, she will not own it, but she will not know it, she will think that she knows it, she owns it. So you have this kind of conflict that, for example, if you were the first to put on the system an application that, that define banking permission or whatever, well, the banking application will still install and she will not own its own permission and the malware could basically grant itself the permission to access the banking uh, services. So that's been solved in, um, in Lollipop. So, as I said, we'll talk about all of that, but in a new way. And uh, a quick demo just to illustrate um, what I mean by limitation. So what I will just do is I will pop up on the screen my Android phone. Sometimes I just have to wait a few seconds, and I hope it will take two seconds. Yes. So, okay. So here we are. So what I will do... I mean... That's better. So I will just install application, and we'll see what the result is. So I will start first an application that requests nothing. So just to, to precise, the, um, this, soft, this uh, phone is running on, um, on Nougat, so it follows the same rule as, um, as Marshmallow. Uh, about the permission. So just, yes, so just a very quick explanation about this screen. So what we see is that we can try to request permission and at the top we have two things very important. The, well it's green on this, uh, on the screen, this green uh, zone says what we can say that the permission, the application have. And if I click on check system permission, I will say that this application basically requested uh, nothing. We cannot see because that's basically it means the request nothing. If we go if we go here, but it's grey, so it's not visible. So I will just now install because because I can. I will install um, other application. So we install two applications. I mean, here again, I will explain later that install multiple applications just for the sake of the demo, but you don't have to install that many. You can just install one and update it and it still works. Uh, so I will install an application that requests nothing. Okay. I will install a second one that requests nothing neither. And now the, the, the trick is to update this application. So I will update the first application after the I mean, we have a lag, so I will wait. Yeah. So I will update the first application as we can see it requests still nothing. And I will open it. So what we can see here is that oh, it requests the internet, but that's a normal permission, so uh, it's granted an install, and it defines its own permission because we can do that, so it defines its permission called deadly activity one. Okay. So I will now do the same thing with the second application. I will install it too, the update, it's requesting nothing. And I will open it. So, what we can see is that uh, she... Hmm. Okay, so basically it does the same thing, but I don't know why the screen is locked, like for the demo, <sighs> just at the end. Um, so I will restart the screen. So basically this app does the same thing, just define its own permission called Deadly Activity 2. Okay, so I just close all the um, application, and now I will open the um, first one. So, which is the application that define nothing, requesting nothing. Okay, so as we see, we open it again. It's on the uh, on the green zone. We have nothing displayed. If we try to see the permission on the system layer, it's still grey, meaning while well, it has nothing, it got granted nothing. So now what we will do is that we try to access user contact. Well, normally this would have crashed because we don't define the permission and we did not request it as a user, so two reasons to fail. Well, we see that we can access contact. I mean, like it's, we have one contact because it's a demo phone. And we do the same thing with calendar. Well, it's the same thing. 
we didn't have the, we didn't define the permission on the um, manifest of the application. We did not have the user to approve to give us access to um, to calendar. The system says that we don't request anything. We are granting nothing. The API level, which I will explain also later, says nothing. Well, we can access everything. So the um, goal of this presentation is to say how is that possible in Marshmallow One Plus to have that. I mean, like, if someone wants me to re-explain, because I think it's very important to understand like what's the implication of that. So it's clear for everyone. If you have questions, we can see later. So, modeling of the permission. So, if we talk first about, like I was saying, I want to talk about user privacy. So, one thing very important is resources. I mean, like, we protect resources. So, um, on Linux, because Android is based on Linux, so we have two concepts, UID and GID. Um, on Android, as said by the Zigot, which fork uh, an application to create the process. So, an application cannot create its own process. That's a manager called the Zigot that does that. And it does two things. When you install an application, its UID is defined, set, and cannot be changed. And when you launch the application, well, it gets granted group IDs based on the permission it has. Generally, UID is made for uh, protecting files. So the application directory is protected on the user ID of the application. And the external directory is protected on uh, the user ID and the group ID called SD card read write. When you talk about GID, so for resources that are not files, um, you have the, um, for example, you have the protection for the network access. So what we have in Android is called the par paranoid networking, which states on the code that you have to, um, to have the good groups. And on the software level API, well, you have what we call service-based EPC preconditioning, which means that if you want to make an EPC call to a service, it will check that you are granted the correct groups or the correct permissions. So if we summarize very quickly, um, what does that mean? Is that here we have the uh, local file system that is protected by UID level. Here you have what we call the services that are called through EPCs that can access resources um, through permission conditioning, so that's implemented by the services, or by a group, so that's implemented at the um, kernel level. So that was for how resources are, let's say, protected uh, in a very general way. So now the question is like, okay, so we have permission that we define the manifest. Well, what does that mean? How does that work? So when you have an application, you define, you call permission, I mean, you define that you want to use permission by the, by the tag called permission uses that says that you want to use either system permissions or other app permissions that are already there. Um, you can also define your own permissions, as I showed on the demo, and you can put them in whatever you want, wherever you want, the way you want. So we are very free on that. Uh, so when you install an application, what happens is that based on the condition of the manifest, the app will be set to UID. So that's what we call about the security of the local file system. You will allow custom permissions that are normal, I mean, that are, yes, normal. And uh, you will stock all of that in a written way on what we call the package uh, with an S.xms that defines all the application installed on, on the software, I mean, on the uh, device. When you have the system permissions, they are predefined, so it will depend on the manufacturer. But if we, if we just stick to the um, Android open source project, you have main permissions such as internet that are associated to group ID, so all of that is predefined when you have um, your device shipped to you. And basically what happens is that when you launch an application, well, based on the um, definition you had at install, you will get a UID. And then the Zigot will use all of that together to uh, grant the uh, GIDs and the permissions. So basically, that's the model. And what we can see here is that we, have, we start to have something complicated, is that it would be easy if we have one application that uses system permission that is granted that process. But because of the shared user ID, you can have multiple applications that somehow interoperate together and use system permission together because they share the same user ID and are granted permission. So here it starts to be much more complex as a simple application at install or at launch get granted something. Like it's like you have to first work on the, inter inter I mean on the cooperation between the definition of multiple applications. And we will see that's not that easy. 
Another important thing to know where the vulnerability will come from is that when you lose the system, everything starts to be built up. So we have what we call the package manager service that just load everything into memory. And at app launch, well, basically you use what is predefined in the memory to assign to the um, process. So obviously, if you preload on memory everything at, uh, at system load for performance reasons, well, you have to be safe about how you handle the evolution of the model. Meaning when you update an application, when you remove an application, you have to be sure that the package manager service updates the model in memory accordingly. And one of the questions we, we have there is that, is it sent? Meaning like, compared to reboot an uh, a device or compared to install an application with a new version, so without the update path, is it the same thing as keeping your device powered up and updating an application? As we will see, the answer is no. Another thing very important is that, as I said before and after Marshmallow, I mean, like, for everybody who builds software, you know that you have a very problematic solution when you make a very big update on, on the software definition, which we call the backward compatibility, which means that you have to be able to still make old application works with the old security model, while the new applications that relies on Mar Marshmallow API well, are not granted by default um, permissions that are dangerous. And this means a lot of implications. Like you have to update the algorithm correctly. When you display to the user, you have to take into account is this application an old application or a new application? And the question is like, what happened with, when, with a single user ID, you have two applications that do not follow the same API level. You have an application that is supposed to be granted everything by default, and an application that's supposed to be granted only normal permission by default. But they are on the same user ID, so they are granted the same permission. So there's a question here again. How do we handle that? I mean, like, how was the vision of Android compared to a uh, strong security, which is you have to as a user, and a weaker one, which is everything is granted and installed? And uh, one of the interesting feedback we got from Google, and I will let you judge, is that they say, well, no, we, pr we show them that it's not sent, but they say, look, yes, but we never promised. I will explain that. Um, so that's a very broad model here again, is that, uh, so when you launch a system, everything is granted, you have the memory, and the user action, install updates or grant permissions, impact another service, and they all of that cooperate together. Finally, last part of the model, then I will go more deeper into the uh, vulnerability mutation explanation. Okay, so we know how it's defined. We know how it's computed. Well, the other question is how it's displayed to the user. So we have what we call the system info. So basically, it displays package permission based on package information. Okay? Um, and the other very important thing is that it's display status. Well, not from the package info, but directly from the system because the system info so it access to the system allocating memory. You have another um, level of display which is used by any security application, which is what we can call the API of the package manager, which display package permission here, the same way as, as above, so based on the package info. But as this is an API that is run at the application uh, level, it doesn't have access to the system memory. So it has to use another way to access the permission, so it's not one person the same thing. Here's a very big model, I mean, I will explain more step by step. So here we have uh, the memory, the definition. Here we have the display. Here we have where that impacts. And here we have some kind of the memory logic. So we see that's not uh, that easy, but it's good because it's not easy, which means that it's likely that you have things to do on that. So, um, subject. That's basically the limitation I will, I, I will present. Um, I will just go back to that after. But basically, on the system, uh, on the model, I explain. I try to put some colors to say the world is good, where is not good, where is debatable. Uh, so green is good. Um, pink, that's not really pink here. Uh, pink is debatable, and red is bad. So we see that we have quite a lot of places and a lot of things that we can play with. Um, and it's interesting. So uh, issues. We can, I will explain four issues. How can you hide permissions from Android? 
Meaning like you, you get granting permission, but you don't display that because it's cool. Uh, how can you hide states? How can you say that the permission is not granted, it is granted? Nobody knows, nobody knows that you have contact. You see that the application request is contact. It says not granted, yet it's granted. I mean like, oh, why is that possible? How to keep unrequested permission? You didn't request a permission, you are granted by another application, you remove the other application while you still have it. Well, you can do that too. And I think the, the, the last part, which I will less explain because it's still not passed by Google, is that how you can auto-grant uh, dangerous permissions such as contact. So basically, that's what I showed in the demo at the end. So first, how can you hide permission from Android? As I said before, when you go to the system information, you display the permissions that are defined on the uh, package info, meaning you put on your manifest that you want to access contact. Even if you are granting something else, it will never be shown because the display relies on what you ask, I mean, on what you define. So the thing is how you can make the system grant you something that you did not request and that will be never shown to the user at any level. Um, I put some source code um, very quickly. And, and basically, what does it say is that on the left, we have what we had on Marshmallow. And on the right, we have what we had on KitKat. I mean, KitKat was fine. It displayed everything, not Marshmallow. And the big issue is that on Marshmallow, we stick to, um, we'll just be sure, yeah, we stick to the package definition. On KitKat, we say, oh, okay, so we have our own definition. We may have a shared user ID. Let's get all the, all the packages that share the same user ID, then federate that together and display. When well, Marshmallow, they decided, well, no, we don't want to do that anymore. We just want to display what we asked. Well, it means that if you use a shared ID concept, another application we have for contact, by, sh by user ID that is shared, you will access contact to, but it will never be displayed because of the decision to stick to the um, package definition. So as I said in the demo, basically, you just have to install two applications, and they will share everything. One of the feedback from Google from that is that it says it's not a security issue and an intended behavior <laughs> because everybody should know that you can share permission across application. Okay. Uh, I, I, I promise I will not make any comments. I'll just let you make your own decision on that. Um, so another interesting thing is how can you make an application flag that's not enabled yet enabled? So here there's a little more... Um, complex because we talk about backward compatibility with app op concept in KitKat. Meaning that here, when you revoke a permission, this try to start to deal with, um, so is it a new application? Is it an old application? If it's an old application, do you have app op? I mean, you see the logic is very complicated. And what we have here is that basically, and this very specific case, which is like if you are not a new application, so you, you follow the old model of KitKat, well, you will try to update the app up. Okay, I mean, that works before. But basically, they just didn't say that uh, we will not grant the permission anymore. So basically, the permission is still here. It's still granted. But only the app up flag, which worked before, is set uh, as denied. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, I mean, it's not that easy uh, to understand the consequences because it's, it's, n it's kind of weird behavior in the end. Because basically what you can do is that you can install two apps, one made for KitKat, one made for Marshmallow, and, gr and, and grant KitKat from KitKat. And what will happen is that here, we have a lot of very weird results. If you stick to contact, well, the application on Marshmallow will say that it has contact access, but when you try to access contact, it will say zero, no matter how many you have. If you try to access from uh, the KitKat application, it will say denied and it will say zero, so that's normal behavior. But the interesting stuff that we in fact discovered yesterday, which is what happened if in fact it's not a system permission. Well, if it's not a system permission, you have much more underneath logic of the app op concept, which says that basically they don't have app op mapping, so they will do nothing. So it will say and grant, and it will still be here. So which means that in fact, the system will believe it's not granted, but it's still granted, and, and you cannot prevent that. Okay, so another, another issue, which is how to keep an unrequested permission, even after the permission on application, I mean, the, the application would define it, is removed. So here again, we have, what happens if we have two applications 
on, on mouse model here, we don't care about the um, ap API compatibility, that says that they want to access internet, Bluetooth, and contact in Canada. So um, here I put a source code, then I will explain the, um, the case. That here we have uh, an interesting thing which says, so this routine is called, it's called the, um, the update shared user permission. So basically the app knows that it's a shared permission, so we try to correctly um, remove the permission from other um, applications that share the same user ID. And we have something very interesting when you look here, it's a very big loop. So basically we try to get all the permissions that the application that is going to be removed requested. And we will see do other application required it or not. If we do not require it, well, normally we will remove the permission from the user ID um, set. But we have one issue, which is what happens when we have group ID. For example, when you, access, when you require internet or you require Bluetooth, you have group IDs at the process level. And when you do not request internet anymore, when nobody requests internet, the group ID has to be removed from the process, otherwise man, you can directly physically access um, by the can at the kernel level because it would be granted the uh, correct groups. So what they say, I mean, the logic here is good, just the implementation is not. It says, okay, so if you do not access a permission that requires a group, uh, well, exit and, and then grant the group. Well, that's good. The only issue is that you should not exist, exit. I mean, like, you should flag the fact that you need to reboot the application, all the application of the shared user ID after you removed all the permission to have the group ID correctly mapped. But if you stop at the middle of the loop, well, what will happen is that the first time you see a permission that has to, that requests a reboot of all the application because of that, well, it stops here. All the rest, that all the other permissions that should have been removed are still here. So an ex 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 example, so I said here, install a KitKat application, that way we don't have to do anything. You install a KitKat application, everything is granted by default. So you have for Bluetooth, internet, contact, calendar. And then you install another application that has nothing. And you remove KitKat. But what will happen is that depending on how the order you define, so if you install, define Bluetooth first, well, you will, uh, you, the, the um, package manager will see that Bluetooth is not requested anymore. It will stop. It will remove, I mean, after having, having removed the Bluetooth permission, it will stop. It will ask all the other permissions of the other, sorry, applications or processes that share the same user ID to restart. But all the other permissions, such as internet, contact, and calendar, will be kept. Which means that the, new, the other application will have nothing. Now, always capable of sending contact and calendar to internet while normally it should not have at all. So that one is under review. And the next part, which I said I will not go into details because I think it's too much um, sensitive, because it's very easy to do, uh, which deals with the concept of, of uh, how the um, update of a permission definition is handled on, uh, on the Android level. Meaning, what's the difference between granting, an application, uh, granting a permission to an application and then updating the definition of this permission compared to grant a permission with the latest version of his definition. It's not the same, unfortunately, and it means that if you define correctly the good permission, I mean, if you define the good way the permission, it will not be requested anything, and if you update it, uh, well, it will have contact or whatever you want. I mean, it will get contact without asking you. So just to say the, um, the truth, we are not, uh, we, we reported this bug two months after the first one, we reported that, but like it was eight months ago and still not patched. Okay, so we're not going to details of others because you can do quite a lot of things, how you can keep permission on the grade, how you can prevent HAP, I mean, how, can, how can you prevent permission from being ungranted? I mean, like the user says ungrant, he thinks he's ungranted but still here. You have quite a few stuff like that that you can do, and you can do also very use F not useful, so useless ones, such as how can you prevent someone from granting you permission? I mean, uh, you can do that. So that's quite interesting. I will just take the time, 10 minutes, that'll be fine. So the other thing important is, like I, I explained very deeply, is the limitation of the algorithm about permission implementation. So okay, so now we see if we can grant permissions and we can do stuff. But the other 
a subject I think in Android that is not well enough debated is like the implication of the UID based model in general um, on Android and what it means for user privacy and how the files are really protected on the system. So what kind of limitation I want to talk about here? I don't want to talk about the UID versus lattice rules models, so it's not a general presentation about airbag versus DAG versus whatever. Uh, it's much more about like how can you trick the user because the user don't know anything about like what's the consequences of UID, what, what does that mean, like it knows nothing. I mean like even the policy of Google is that the user should know nothing and everything should work fine. So how can you trick the user so that in fact he doesn't know what he's doing, he thinks everything is safe because he trusts Google, well he should not. So that's, that's the kind of limitation I want to talk about. And, uh, and three examples, which is how can you bypass the concept of jail by shared UID? How can you bypass the concept of UID security by in virtualization and app security by in virtualization? So what UID is, in fact, that's a very complicated subject on Android because UID is not associated to an app because shared UID. It's not associated to publisher key because you may have multiple applications made by the same uh, developers that don't have the same UID. I mean, if they don't have the same shared user ID, each application has its own UID. But the set of application, but I mean, like, the set of UID is included within the set of applications. So it's kind of a mix between, like, a set of UID belongs to a publisher and only a publisher, but it's not pair application. Meaning, like, if you grant a uh, permission to, to an app, well, you don't grant a permission to an app, you grant a permission to a UID. But you don't know if this grant is to an app or to a set on the app. And that's impossible to know without any security application because Google do not show you that. And uh, it's by design. I mean, the thing, the thing is very important is that by desi design, they decided to do that. And, and by design, you also have permissions that are not displayed. You have system applications that will not, do not show that they have contact, yet they have contact. So you can have a set of a configuration when nobody knows that contact is has yet is shared. So like this concept of UID doesn't make any sense really when you have this kind of shared UID and, and choice to hide stuff. And then when you want to go to external storage definition, that's even worse because you have UID and the external storage, but it's more controlled by remote services. So the UID doesn't make any sense neither. So like it's very not clear for the user what the consequences of security of the uh, file system um, on, on Android. So that was like a very quick um, a party about like the UID definition limitation because of this old def decision and shared UID. Another thing very interesting is what we call in-app virtualization. So I, I flagged something at previous virtualization, which was what we had before, which is what we call dynamically loaded executable code. So the goal for that is was to hide um, automated analysis, to make the code uh, like uh, the, the malware payload encrypted and whatever. And then, so that was Gulligan. Google, Google and then now you have quite very stable um, open source uh, libraries that allows you to do what we call in-app virtualization, meaning like you have an app that powers within the app a virtualized Android system that in which you can run, but like really run, other applications. So it's a lot of very good features, but it's kind of here again. The users don't know that. I mean, like the user will never know that if we install a game, it has the capacity to open Facebook within the game and contro control the game. I mean, like before you can load code, but you cannot load application. So now you can have very interesting attacks, and we see that with Plugin Phantom and Imbing Bad. Basically, what they do is that they load up within their own environment and they can control it. And by that, you can do quite a lot of very good stuff because as you share the same UID, uh, I mean, as everything is the same process, it's very hard to detect because if you have a very good virtualization implementation, even projects such as the anti plugin project are limited because if you make the application that is virtualized, so hosted, not capable of detecting that she is virtualized, well, she cannot know. But what she will know is that, uh, what she will not know is that the data she has is owned by the host. And I, I will show that later. And as I said, right now it's poorly implemented, but it's already there. But it's poorly implemented because it's, it's not really stable. And we can do a lot of other stuff that's not seen yet on the market, which is memory structure rewrite. So a very quick question that I had since to a talk at another security conference, which is, 
who knows the concept of multi-space? Like, like parallel apps and all these concepts that allows you to run multiple Facebook instances on the same device. And who use that? I mean, like, you should not. Um, because, well, I mean, like, a lot of users did. I mean, like, I want to mention user misjudgment. Nobody knows the consequences of using parallel space and other apps. But what you have here is that here, when you try to grab the Facebook concept, I mean, you will see that Facebook is run by two different UID. That's the normal UID, which is A113. But the host, which is the ID 146, also runs Facebook within its own ID, so its own process. So it controls it. When you talk about files, that's the same thing. That's the expected location of Facebook data. And on the virtualizer, it's stored on the virtualizer data, meaning the virtualizer can access all the data that Facebook store, contact database, everything is owned and accessed without any request by the uh, host. So uh, I will go very quickly on that because I really want to, to finish the other stuff in uh, five minutes. So um, question, was the impact of new security mechanism on Android? So I don't know if you have heard about protect, play protect and, and trouble. Um, I think it would be very hard to, for PlayProtect to detect advanced virtualization capabilities because like, it's not hidden behavior, it's expected behavior. The goal of PlayProtect is to detect bad behavior. But if your app is defined as a virtualizer, well, it's not bad. Just nobody understands what does that mean. I mean, like, no user understands the consequences of that. And with trouble, here again, was the impact, it would be a very good question to see in the future. So I will just go very quickly. Here, that's all the bugs we submitted to Google. So we had one working as intended, so we decided to split it in 13. And now we're discussing with Google, it's much more interesting than only one. We may run on multiple apps. Uh, and what we can see is that on the market, everybody's nearly fine. Like, nobody is exploiting anything. When you compare to viruses on databases, nobody is trying to do this kind of advanced ma uh, algorithm checks. And the question is, what, what will happen when we start to have that? I mean, like, Android is already known for malware, but it's kind of, let's say, malware that has permission. Well, I mean, they, they can allow to not even ask. So what will happen when we start to have that? When we talk to compare security um, apps that exist on the market, I will say that even the security apps do not take that into account. They will sometimes, some, some of them will display the status of the permission, but not all of them. So basically, we not know if an application access contact or not, because the app, the app says, yes, it defined it, but you don't know if it asked or not. We don't know if it's granted or not. So like here again, the security apps have a lot to do to be able to cope with this new implication of Marshmallow plus uh, permission model. And a very quick conclusion, I think I'm on time. Um, even if I, I, I criticize a lot the limitation of the model, I mean, like, one thing to know is that, basically, I was talking about the limitation of the update path. But, like, you have all the underneath security, which is, which is like, the um, permission protection that EPC called, which is very robust and very well implemented. I mean, like, we spent months trying to, to see what we could do stuff, and it's, like, it's very hard to, to hack. And rebooting the device fix the problem, but, like, uh, What's the hard that you will reboot the device after each application is start update? I don't know. Uh, security applications are still needed, I believe, because play, protect, and trouble projects are good, but do not cope with some limitation, and will not, because that's not the goal. And what's important is that the security applications should uh, really focus on what they do, meaning they provide security, they don't provide display to the user, so they should understand that, in fact, what does, does the display things correctly or not? much more work to do here about like not only using Android package manager function, but also understand the application of that would be very good to have better security solution. And obviously we have a lot of new challenges like instant apps, pro uh, projects that started to be available to developer, uh, trouble as I mentioned, virtualization capability, which means that we still have a lot of things to see in the future. And thank you for listening to me. If you have any questions, I'm free. After also to.